Come on, let's give a great big hand clap to everybody. If you don't mind, reach over to the person next to you, if you don't mind talking. Uh, and just tell them, welcome to a different type of experience. Come on, tell them. Now, listen. Anybody who knows me knows that, number one, I want to welcome everybody. Uh, we're extremely excited and thankful for everyone being here today. Grateful for uh, our members and of but our church Moses experiencing something different. And uh, thankful that you all are but experiencing something different. But we want them to know uh, that you are Israel absolutely 100% And God welcome. said, I will be And this will be the sign to you that it is I who have sent you. Now, I know when you we have do something a little different. Out of and, Egypt, um, you will worship one God of the things I hate is that how mountain. polarized Moses we have said become, to the Lord, how racial we have become. Lord. And I think that oftentimes we forget been eloquent. that we're all a part of Not humanity. Right? Nor since you have spoken to yourself. <laughs> I am so I know some of you are probably going to talk to me slow. after I talk about me after I do of this, but speech. I just. You know, and I'm the pastor, so the I can Lord do it. Amen. And you. What about and I got the microphone. There's nothing you can say about it. I know but when I was young, well. we used to play this game called. He is already on chairs. his way to meet you, and his heart will be right. glad when he anybody, sees you. Anybody play musical chairs? You shall anybody? speak to him and put words in his mouth. And the object of it is I will help when you both heard the music, and will teach you what to do. He will speak to, to the people for you, and, and it I will be as if he were your mouth. And what better you were way to go to back him. to our childhood? But take this stuff and what in your hand way to so you can perform the signs with it. Really just practice what we're all going to be doing when we get to heaven. There's not going to be a Jewish section or a Christian section or a white section or a brown section or a black section. You know, over here are the blacks and over here are the Jews and over here are the... None of that. So why come to church and sit beside somebody that you've been seeing and knowing all of your life, right? I guarantee every person sitting in here, you know that person and you've probably been knowing them a long time. It's probably a few of you all that are sitting beside somebody that you don't know that's different. So besides all the people who are going to be participating in worship, this is not for you and this is not for you all and this is not for you, but we're gonna do this little game called musical chairs. And when you hear the music stop, you sit down. Now, if you don't wanna participate, no hard feelings, just stay where you are. I'm not gonna, I know some of you have been with your spouse for a long time and you just can't leave her side. For an hour, I have to be with you, babe. So if you don't want to do it, you don't have to. But Philip is going to give us some good music. And when you hear the music stop, you just take a seat. And in between time, you just walk around, say hello, greet some people, all right? On the count of three. You're going to greet some people. You're going to say hello. We're going to turn on the lights, eight. We're going to turn on the lights. You're going to say hello. We're going to have a great experience. When you hear the music, then you stop. Everybody, come on. Here we go. Yeah, greet some people. That's it. Now we look more like, that's it. Yeah, that's it. Come on, keep the music going. Give everybody time to move around. Hello, my name is. Hello, my name is. That's it, come on, keep it going. That's it, there you go, move around. Yeah. I'm gonna sit beside a Christian today. I'm gonna sit beside a Jewish person today. I'm gonna sit beside somebody black today, brown today, white today. That's it, there you go. Big old smile on your face. That's how you do it. Yeah, that's how you do it. Come on, move around. We got 30 more seconds. Come on. That's it. Yeah. Come on, 15 more seconds. That's it. Come on.
that's great right there. Come on, everybody, find a seat. Come on, make it look like Neapolitan ice cream in here. Come on. That's it. Now, everybody should probably be sitting beside someone different. So go ahead and take a second, reintroduce yourself. possibly give one two three yeah yeah welcome to new beginnings thank you for being here today let's have a great and a wonderful time this whole experience is going to be a, a true learning experience for some of us. And for some of us, it's going to just be a great, joyful experience going back over a history that some know so well, a, a history of freedom and liberation, of struggle, and depending on God, I think we all can relate to that. And so we want you to enjoy the worship. We want you to enjoy the singing. We want you to enjoy the speakers. Uh, and we're just going to have a great time. And New Beginnings, I know you're used to being out in 90 minutes. And I promise you we're going to try to get it done in 90 minutes. For those of you who think you guys came to a black church and we're going to be here all day, black people tell them, no, we're not. No, <laughs> no you're not. <laughs> we want to get to lunch, too. <laughs> but enjoy yourself. Make yourself comfortable. Enjoy the experience. The older I get, the more I'm trying to just enjoy every experience that God allows me to have, especially those experiences that are different. And so enjoy today, enjoy the music, enjoy the speakers, and let's just have a wonderful time together. Amen. A house full of shalom. Amen. The descendants of Jacob numbered 70 in all. Joseph was already in Egypt. Now Joseph and all his brothers and all that generation died. But the Israelites were exceedingly fruitful. They multiplied greatly, increased in numbers, and became so numerous that the land was filled with them. Then a new king, to whom Joseph meant nothing, came to power in Egypt. Look. He said to his people, The Israelites have become far too numerous for us. Come, we must deal shrewdly with them or they will become even more numerous. And if war breaks out, we'll join our enemies, fight against us, and leave the country. So they put slave masters over them to oppress them with forced labor. And they built Python and Ramesses as store cities for Pharaoh. But the more they were oppressed, the more they multiplied and spread. So the Egyptians came to dread the Israelites and worked them ruthlessly. They made their lives bitter with harsh labor in brick and mortar and with all kinds of work in the fields. In all their harsh labor, the Egyptians used them ruthlessly.
Exodus says the Israelites languished in misery and suffering and a broken spirit. On April 2nd, 1943, in the middle of a raging world war, there were about 8 million slave laborers in Nazi Germany. One of them was Benjamin, 15 years old, and another Miriam, 14 years old. They were later to become my parents. They were exploited and tormented. They were hungry and they were always afraid. But my parents heard in their childhood the Passover story told at their table every year. And they remembered that miraculous rescue. And it helped sustain them. It helped protect them from despair, from a broken spirit. Today we'll tell that story from slavery to freedom. It gave hope to my parents and to generations of enslaved people. Because in telling the story, we reject the assumptions upon which slavery is built. That one group of people is superior to the other. That one group of people is less human or not human. Because when you believe that there are people who are not human, then no matter what you do to them cannot be inhumane. We reject the idea of dehumanizing any people. In telling the Passover story, we recount the tears of the oppressed, but we remind ourselves that we, every one of us, is created in God's image.
y'all sing that with me. Oh, we say glory, glory, hallelujah. Sing it one more time. Glory, hallelujah. Pharaoh commanded all his people, Every son that is born to the Hebrews you shall cast into the Nile, but you shall let every daughter live. Now a man from the house of Levi went and took as his wife a Levite woman. The woman conceived and bore a son, and when she saw that he was a fine child, she hid him three months. When she could hide him no longer, she took for him a basket made of bulrushes and daubed it with bitumen and pitch. She put the child in it and placed it among the reeds by the riverbank. And his sister stood at a distance to know what would be done to him. Now the daughter of Pharaoh came down to bathe at the river while her young women walked beside the river. She saw the basket among the reeds and sent her servant woman and she took it. When she opened it, she saw the child and behold, the baby was crying. She took pity on him and said, this is one of the Hebrews' children. She named him Moses. Because, she said, I drew him out of the water. Shifra, Pua, Yaakoved, Miriam, and Betia. These names are not spoken often, but absolutely essential in the story of Moses. His very survival depended on their love, their compassion, their sacrifice, and their fear of God. Shifra and Pua inspired with civil disobedience, risking their lives to please God. Exodus 1.17 says that they feared God and did not do as Moses, had, as Pharaoh, sorry, had ordered. They feared God more than they feared man. Yaakoved's love for her son caused her to risk her life. She sacrificed and no doubt spent a lot of time in isolation to hide her son from the tyranny of Pharaoh. Miriam served as Moses' protector and watched over him, which resulted in him being returned to his mother's arms unharmed. She stood at a distance and watched after Moses' mother had placed him in the basket and put him in the river. This returned him to her and made sure that he was safe. Bitia, whom most people don't know, was the daughter of Pharaoh. She had compassion for Moses, and she defied her father's decree and took him to be her own. Love, compassion, respect for life, civil disobedience, and most importantly, fear of God. Through these brave women, the deliverance of a nation was possible.
more time say I need I need come on sing it if you know it you need we're all Now Moses was tending the flock of Jethro, his father-in-law, the priest of Midian, and he led the flock to the far side of the desert and came to Horeb, the mountain of God. There the angel of the Lord appeared to him in flames of fire from within a bush. Moses saw that though the bush was on fire, it did not burn up. When the Lord saw that he had gone over to look, God called to him from within the bush, Moses, Moses. And Moses said, Here I am. Do not come any closer. God said, Take off your sandals, for the place where you are standing is holy ground. Then he said, I am the God of your father, the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, and the God of Jacob. I have indeed seen the misery of my people in Egypt. I have heard them crying out because of their slave drivers, and I am concerned about their suffering. So I have come down to rescue them from the hand of the Egyptians, and to bring them up out of that land into a good and spacious land, a land flowing with milk and honey, the home of the Canaanites, Hittites, Amorites, Perizzites, Hivites, and Jebusites. And now the cry of the Israelites has reached me, and I have seen the way the Egyptians are oppressing them. So now go. I am sending you to Pharaoh to bring my people, the Israelites, out of Egypt. A bush, not a cedar tree, not an oak tree, not a redwood, a lowly, thorny, rugged bush, a flame and not consumed. Moses saw in the flame that burned that bush, the flame in his own heart for justice, justice that he executed in Egypt by slaying the Egyptian who beat the Hebrew. 
and his love of justice manifested when he interceded between the brothers, the two Hebrew slaves fighting with each other. God's response was in that bush, saying to Moses, I see that love of justice that rests within your breast. And from within your breast, we're going to expand that love and bring it out into the world as a whole together. And Moses said, behold myself, Hineni, here I am ready to serve. There's just one slight little change. The words that you might be seeing um, are by Courtney Patton. It's a little different um, arrangement of the song. So if they're showing you different words, sing those and I'll sing mine. <laughs> To Moses at the burning bush, at the burning bush, at the burning bush. God spoke to Moses at the burning bush, saying, I'm the Lord thy God. Take your shoes off, Moses. Holy ground, holy ground, it's holy ground. Take your shoes off, Moses. You're on holy ground, for I'm the Lord your God. Go yonder, Moses, and smite that rock. Smite that rock. Smite that rock. Go yonder, Moses, and smite that rock. Say, I'm the Lord your God. Take them off. To choose of Moses, you're on holy ground. You're on holy ground. You're on holy ground. Take your shoes off, Moses, you're on holy ground. For I'm the Lord your God. Stand still, Moses, see my salvation work, see my salvation work, see my salvation work. Stand still, Moses, see my salvation work, say I'm the Lord your God. Take your shoes off, Moses, you're on holy ground, you're on holy ground, you're on holy ground. Take your shoes off, Moses, you're on holy ground. No music. Take your Moses said to God, Who am I that I should go to Pharaoh and bring the Israelites out of Egypt? And God said, I will be with you, and this will be the sign to you that it is I who have sent you. When you have brought the people out of Egypt, you will worship God on this mountain. Moses said to the Lord, Pardon your servant, Lord. I have never been eloquent, neither in the past, nor since you have spoken to your servant. I am slow of speech and tongue. The Lord said to him, What about your brother Aaron, the Levite? I know he can speak well. He is already on his way to meet you, and his heart will be glad when he sees you. You shall speak to him and put words in his mouth. I will help both of you speak and will teach you what to do. He will speak to the people for you and it will be as if he were your mouth and as if you were God to him. But take this staff in your hand so you can perform the signs with it.
oftentimes we tend to ask the question to God, why me? Why would you choose somebody like me? And in all actuality, the reason why we ask those questions is because we tend to look at ourselves through the lens of our faults and not through the lens of how God sees us. God doesn't see your stutter. He doesn't see your issue. He doesn't see your proclivity. When God sees you, he sees your destiny. Quit bringing your problems to God without bringing your problems uh, without bringing God to your problems. God understands every issue and every situation. And I'm here to tell you, you have enough to do what he's told you to do. Go and do the work he's called you to do. And the Lord said to Moses, See, I have made you like God to Pharaoh. You shall speak all that I command you, and your brother Aaron shall tell Pharaoh to let the people of Israel go out of his land. Pharaoh will not listen to you. Then I will lay my hand on Egypt and bring my hosts, my people, the children of Israel, out of the land of Egypt by great acts of judgment. So Moses and Aaron went to Pharaoh and did just as the Lord commanded. Aaron cast down his staff before Pharaoh and his servants, and it became a serpent. Behold, with the staff that is in my hand, I will strike the water that is in the Nile, and it shall turn into blood. Aaron stretched out his hand over the waters of Egypt, and the frogs came up and covered the land of Egypt. Stretch out your staff and strike the dust of the earth, so that it may become gnats in all the land of Egypt. Behold, I will send swarms of flies on you and your servants and your people and into your houses. Behold, the hand of the Lord will fall with a very severe plague upon your livestock that are in the field. Take handfuls of soot from the kill and let Moses throw them in the air in the sight of Pharaoh. 
it shall become fine dust over all the land of Egypt. Then Moses stretched out his staff toward heaven, and the Lord sent thunder and hail, and fire ran down to the earth. The hail struck down everything that was in the field in all the land of Egypt, both man and beast. Stretch out your hand over the land of Egypt for the locusts, so that they may come upon the land of Egypt locusts. and eat every plant in the land. Stretch out your hand toward heaven, that there may be darkness over the land of Egypt, a darkness to be felt. Thus says the Lord, about midnight I will go out in the midst of Egypt, and every firstborn in the land of Egypt shall die, from the firstborn of Pharaoh who sits on his throne, even to the firstborn of the slave girl who is behind the handmill. Pestilence, wild beasts, hail, boils, locusts, darkness, death of the firstborn. With each successive plague, Egypt's confidence waned, and Israel's trust in Moses grew. Egypt was pitted against Israel, and Moses was pitted against Pharaoh, presenting two diametrically opposed kinds of leadership. Moses, who led through his humility, and Pharaoh, who led through his hubris. Through his double exile, first exiled from his family, then a banished fugitive in Midian, Moses learned that the only true way to God is through humility. Whereas Pharaoh believed only in his own greatness. I do not know him, he said. We will raise a generation of leaders who lead through humility and do not need to be educated by plague and disaster to know what is right. As Christians generally sing that psalm quite a bit, this program started with, I will lift up mine eyes to the hills and will come with my help. It's our Jewish brothers and sisters who generally focus on verse 4. He that keepeth Israel shall neither slumber nor sleep.
my glory to you. You are my glory and the lift. Israelites went through the sea on dry ground with a wall of water on their right and on their left. The Egyptians pursued them, and all Pharaoh's horses and chariots and horsemen followed them into the sea. During the last watch of the night, the Lord looked down from the pillar of fire and cloud of the Egyptian army and threw it into confusion. He jammed the wheels of their chariots so that they had difficulty driving. And the Egyptians said, Let's get away from the Israelites. The Lord is fighting for them against Egypt. Then the Lord said to Moses, Stretch out your hand over the sea, so that the waters may flow back over the Egyptians and their chariots and horsemen. Moses stretched out his hand over the sea, and at daybreak the sea went back to its place. The Egyptians were fleeing toward it, and the Lord swept them into the sea. The water flowed back and covered the chariots and horsemen. The entire army of Pharaoh that had followed the Israelites into the sea. Not one of them survived. I don't know about you, but oftentimes when we tell this story, we focus on Moses and we focus on what he had to do to get the Red Sea to split. But sometimes it's necessary for us to put ourselves in the shoes of the Israelites that were leaving that were not Moses. Mm -hmm. What do you do when you are running away from something that you think that you're free from? 
and it's chasing you down like a dog. There are plenty of people in this room that knows what it feels like to finally beat something that has oppressed you, whether it's grief, whether it's addiction, whether it's bondage of any kind, and you get that feeling, man, I've got it. And while you're on your way to freedom, what you thought you beat is chasing you quicker than you can walk. But the good news is, is that we serve a God that knows how to split the Red Sea that's standing right in front of you. All you got to do is stretch your hands and believe and have faith. And that Red Sea that seems like a barrier shall be a miracle. Freedom, free, untethered to anything or anyone, dumb, a state of being. What then is freedom? Freedom is not living without boundaries, rules, or consequences. 
Just like adolescents and teenagers express their desire for freedom as they do, to do as they please, they also need it and they want, at that time, parental assistance and security. The freedom from Egypt was one manner of freedom from a governing ruler, but once out of Egypt, and once out in the desert, the Hebrews once again yearned as young children to be taken care of. They turned to Moses and ultimately to God. But once they were fed and protected by the hot sun and even given water in the desert, they complained once again. A delusional state of mind, they began to reminisce of the good old days back in Egypt. And then they then came commandments, rules. They didn't like these new boundaries, even in the open spaces of a desert. They wanted to be free. The key to freedom is not individual liberties, but liberty and justice for all. A delicate equilibrium between four players, one's self, one's fellow human being, the greater society, and God. Today, the message of freedom revisited every Passover is as critical as ever. We need to keep telling our story to the world and keep telling that story to ourselves. A freedom that places demands instead of merely lifting barriers, a freedom that helps us live with others in peace and in justice. In this sacred space, allow me to recall Martin Luther King Jr who paraphrased the prophets when he wrote, we are all caught in an inescapable network of mutuality, tied in a single garment of destiny. Whatever affects one directly affects all indirectly. Thus, let us work together for freedom to sing to God for by God's laws, he has rescued us all. Has 
have no other gods before me. You shall not make for yourself a carved image. You shall not take the name of the Lord your God in vain, for remember the Sabbath day to keep it holy. Six days you shall labor and do all your work. Honor your father and your mother. You shall not murder. You shall not commit adultery. You shall not steal. You shall not bear false witness against your neighbor. You shall not covet your neighbor's house. You shall not covet your neighbor's wife, nor his male servant, nor his female servant, nor his ox, nor his donkey, nor anything that is your neighbor. It 
It is said that in the, what's called the redemption narrative that the Torah was given at Shavuot, 50 days or 49 days, depending on how you count it, after the Passover. And Jewish tradition also holds that though God was writing and speaking in Hebrew, if you were there and spoke other languages, you would hear the word of God in your own language supernaturally which is a testimony to the fact that our Jewish brothers and sisters have the burden of taking Torah to the nations. Ironically, for those of us as Christians, Shavuot is Pentecost when the Holy Spirit came and the word of God was spoken in every language under heaven. And particularly in the gospel church tradition, one of the oldest songs that reflects that is actually based in Isaiah chapter two. And I'm going to sing it real quick and I'm going to sit down. Y'all in on it. I'm going to lay down my burdens down by the riverside. Down by the riverside. Down by the riverside. I'm going to lay down my burdens down by the riverside. Go study. in the synagogue, our Jewish brothers and sisters quote a verse from that passage. It's from Isaiah. And the mountain of the Lord's house shall be exalted above every mountain and every nation shall flow to it. And they shall say, come let us go up to the mountain of the Lord, to the house of the God of Jacob. He will teach us of his ways and we will walk in his path. For ki mitzion teitzek Torah, who devar Adonai miyerushadim. Out from Zion goes forth the law and the word of the Lord from to Jerusalem. And it says, and he shall judge among the nations and decide for many peoples. Swords shall be beaten into plowshares and spears into pruning hooks and neither shall nation lift up sword against nation anymore. And they will study war no more. It's a testimony that everyone will wind up in Jerusalem. Everyone will wind up in Zion to hear the word of God. What happened on the redemption day is a forecasting of everyone coming and hearing the word of God. God bless you. Clap your hands off the room, just like this. If you feel good, you can stand on your feet. That's fine. You and family. Come on, let's get that clap going.
it down in there. Because if I put it on my clothes, you can snatch it off. If I just put it on my skin, it may get damaged and bruised. But if I hide it inside of my heart, that's where no man can pluck it up. That's where no man can uproot it. You gotta put the word of God down in your heart. And at the times when you don't understand, guess what he promised? To give you peace that passes all understanding. So if you receive his peace on this morning, clap those hands as loud and as fast as you can. When the people saw that Moses delayed to come down from the mountain, the people gathered themselves together to Aaron and said to him, Up! Make us gods who shall go before us. As for this Moses, the man who brought us up out of the land of Egypt, we do not know what has become of him. And the Lord said to Moses, Go down, for your people whom you brought up out of the land of Egypt have corrupted themselves. They have turned aside quickly out of the way that I commanded them. They have made for themselves a golden calf and have worshiped it and sacrificed to it and said, These are your gods, O Israel who brought you up out of the land of Egypt. And the Lord said to Moses, I have seen this people, and behold, it is a stiff-necked people. I have been to that mountain. I have been to that wilderness, that wilderness where they call the wilderness of Sinai, that mountain where the locals call Jabba Musa the holy mountain of God and Moses. I've been to that wilderness, but you've been to that wilderness as well. You've been to the wilderness where everything seems so harsh and so foreign, where you don't know which way to turn and which way to go. We've all been to that wilderness. But the other thing about the wilderness is that it is vast and beautiful. And you know who's with us in that wilderness? God is with us in that wilderness. And Moses went up to that mountaintop where heaven meets earth. You've been to that mountaintop where that thin line between your spiritual aspirations touch the glory of God. And touched by God, Moses came down from the mountaintop and behold, the children of Israel were dancing around an idol. We've all danced around that idol. We've all let that fear of the unknown grasp our souls. We've all behaved badly. We've all worshiped the wrong thing. And Moses in his anger took those tablets and he broke them. And we've all felt that brokenness. You live with that brokenness. I live with that brokenness. So now let me tell you what happens to the brokenness inside of us. Moses goes back up to the mountain, brings back another couple tablets. The word of God is among us. The word of God today lives among us. And Israelites, do not throw away the broken tablets. They take the pieces next to the wholeness and put it in the holy tabernacle and journey forth. Take your brokenness and lay it beside your holiness. Take what is broken inside of you and know what is whole inside of you is also journeying forth because no matter what happens, we are entering into the wilderness or leaving the wilderness. And you know who's with us? God is with us in the wilderness.
Moses went up from the plains of Moab to Mount Nebo, and the Lord showed him all the land, Gilead as far as Dan, all Naphtali, the land of Ephraim and Manasseh, all the land of Judah as far as the western sea, the Negev and the plain, that is the valley of Jericho, the city of palm trees as far as Zoar. And the Lord said to him, This is the land of which I swore to Abraham, to Isaac, and to Jacob. I will give it to your offspring. I have let you see it with your eyes, but you shall not go over there. So Moses, the servant of the Lord, died there in the land of Moab, according to the word of the Lord. children of Israel wandered for 40 years. That was considered a generation until they became a people under the rule of law. They didn't see themselves as slaves. They saw themselves as free women and men. And then Moses went on top to Mount Nebo and God showed him the whole promised land and said, you can't go there. You can see it. But Moses was, with the help of God, a visionary. He saw the promised land. He saw the promise that we have inside us. And we are blessed with some visionary leaders who see our promise. I want to ask one to stand up, Pastor Dumasani Washington. He sees a promise of uplifting a generation of young people to become peace ambassadors. What can we use now more than peace ambassadors? And then there is Corey Brooks. for 40 days. But he sat on a roof across from this building for almost a year in the cold and the rain and the heat and the storms. He sat there because he saw a promise, a promised land for his community. Corey Brooks took Moses' example of leadership into his heart. He thinks big. He articulates his vision. He gets rid of obstacles, and you better not be one of them. It doesn't matter how cold it gets. It doesn't matter how tired he gets. It doesn't matter how many people say you can't do it. It doesn't matter how long it takes or how many phone calls he has to make. He sees the promised land. And 
tonight, to this morning, we're going to all say, and then soon we'll hear what we should say when we are blessed with leaders like that. Hallelujah!
Come on, everybody, let's give God a great big hand clap of praise. Oh, you can do better than that. Wasn't this an awesome experience? After the bondage and slavery, after the signs and wonders, and Pharaoh finally releasing the people of Israel, when they finally get out of the struggle, the heartache, and the pain, Moses does something that I thought was remarkable. In Exodus 35, the children of Israel needed a tabernacle, needed a place where they could teach their principles, where they could train their children, where they could experience the very presence of God, a place of transformation, a place where they can celebrate what God had done. And in Exodus 35, after all they had been through, it said that Moses stood before the people and called for an offering. And you would think that people who had just gotten out of bondage, people who had just gotten out of slavery, would their hearts would be hard toward that idea, that concept of giving an offering. But one of the things that we learned is that leaders are givers. Moses showed by example of himself giving. And not just Moses, but all of the leaders of Israel, they, they gave. Not just Moses and all the leaders of Israel, but all of the people gave when Moses called for an offering, a gift to God. Matter of fact, they valued generosity so much that in Exodus 36, it says that they gave so much and I've never experienced this. I'm hoping one day to experience this. They gave so much that Moses said, enough. And I thought, how could a people who had been in bondage, a people who had been in struggle, a people who had been in slavery, respond to such an offering and a request that they give so much that the leader Moses said, enough, stop. And I realized when you have people who understand that giving is an act of worship. I enjoy the singing, I enjoy the lifting of my hands, I enjoy the praising, don't get me wrong, I enjoy going to church, I enjoy going to the synagogue. And by the way, if you can't find me, I'll be at some synagogue listening to Rabbi Karen. I told the cantor that. He said, well, she's retired. I said, well, good. We'll hire her on staff. <laughs> Giving is an act of worship. It says that, God, I realize that if it were not for you, I wouldn't even be here today. That every good and perfect gift that I have, everything that I have, God, it comes directly from you. And I realize that God gives blessings to who he can get blessings through. Giving is an act of worship. And just like the people of Israel were trying to build something that brought honor to God here on 66 and King Drive. We're trying to build something to help our community. We're trying to build something that gives honor back to God. 
and we realize it can't happen without people who believe in giving as an act of worship. And so whenever we gather in our experiences here at our church, we always give. Every Sunday we call for our church to give a tithe, a tenth of everything that they have. And I love our church so much because they're not giving out of their abundance. Off time, they are giving out of their lack. But they do it because they understand that giving is an act of worship. Across the street, if you have a chance, I want you to take a look at what we're going to build. It's nothing there now but dirt. But we believe that God has promised us something. And we're going after it, after it with tenacity. And we're doing it, and we're trying to do it without any debt. Because we realize what debt has done to our community. Come on, everybody. It has been a hindrance. And so we're building across the street, $35 million center. We raised $28.5 million in 14 months. Okay, let me say that again because... I said we raised $28.5 million in 14 months. And so just like we do every Sunday, this is what we say. To all of the members of New Beginnings, you know that God requires us to tithe. That God requires us to give an offering. And I know somebody's going to say, I wonder if pastor's going to say up today with all of these guests, but yes, I am. If you're a guest, we're not asking you for anything. We are just grateful and thankful that you joined us in a worship experience. But if you so choose, during this giving, this act of worship, then we want to ask you to sow, to give, to be a blessing. So here's what we're going to do. Be in your seat, there are offering envelopes. On the screen, they will have different ways that you can give to our ministry, to our work, whether it's to New Beginnings Church or Project Hood. Matter of fact, this is the first Sunday where we have completely remodeled our church. And we did it because y'all were coming. <laughs> so we got new carpet, we got new chairs, we got new floors, and we're working on our side with the school. We have a school on the other side. We're, we're getting ready to start another school for kindergarten through eighth grade. <laughs> for black boys specifically who come from single parent households and who live below the poverty line and we're going to have the best teachers that we can find hopefully mostly male teachers because 80% of the households in our neighborhood are single parent households and we want to give them a positive male role model and we're not going to charge any tuition we're just gonna require parents to participate in their child's education. And we're gonna to continue to ask people from all across America to be a blessing to us. Because we really do believe, we really do believe that God placed us in this hood on 66 and King Drive to be a model for not just Chicago, but for America and the world, when people fully commit themselves and work together, what can happen? And no one, absolutely no one, not a devil in hell can stop a group that is committed and working together. So, just like Moses, I want to call for an offering. And if your heart is moved to give, then give. 
those of you who are members of New Beginnings Church, the music ministry is going to start singing after I pray. And all you need to do is leave from where you are, come and lay your gift on the altar and just say, God, bless my family, bless my finances, bless my church, and bless the vision that we have to transform this community. If you want to give later, do that. And just so you know, we're not watching who gives because we've learned here there's only one audience that we're trying to please. And reach over to your neighbor and tell them you're not the audience. <laughs> we're trying to please God. So when I say amen, if you're so moved, then today, Let's give an offering so big that I have to say, stop! We love you. We thank you. What a wonderful opportunity you have given us today. As we give this offering and go back to our seats, Lord, we give you all honor and all praise. We thank you for bringing us all together. Amen. One, two, three, come on.